Today, on Commitment to Truth. You always have this comparison to the flesh and those that are around you and pictures that you see. But the wonderful promise that God gives you and I is that when we discipline the soul, He will make sure, He will bring conviction in your heart. Welcome to Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Each week, Pastor Cedric Brown and the pastoral team at Commitment Church strive to draw you into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we continue a series titled, In Awe. Because our lives can be very hectic, we often forget to spend time thinking about how awesome the God we worship really is. Spending time thinking about and just being in awe of our God can help to revitalize our relationship with Him. This week, Pastor Cedric Brown will continue to teach us how we can be in awe of God. He will teach us that, though it sometimes hurts, we should accept his discipline and training as it prepares us to serve and live for him. He will also teach us how we should live as those who have received God's healing. Finally, we will learn how to live peacefully with everyone as well as sanctified, set apart for the Lord and from the world. Here is Pastor Cedric lead pastor of Commitment Church with today's message. So if you can, open your Bibles again to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and we start with verse 1 to answer the question, uh, how do we live in awe of God? We've answered it nine ways. I won't review it with you, uh, but I'll pick up at number 10, which is found in verse 11 through 14. But for context, we're going to back up to verse 7, okay? So Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse number 7, it says this. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Verse 9. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respect them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they discipline us for a short time as seen best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. Verse 11 is where we find our 10th answer to the question, how do we live in awe of God? It says this, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, which most of us can say amen to that, right? Yet to those who have been trained by it, Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Now, what I want to do is just kind of review with you uh, what we've been discovering about discipline or God's discipline is totally different than the discipline that we've experienced uh, with our, our mothers and fathers and our those who are in authority over us because chances are one's discipline by mom or dad is when you did something wrong, you got caught in it, then you become what? Discipline. That's kind of where we draw the line with discipline. But when it comes to uh, God's discipline, he disciplines us prior to the act. You follow me? In other words, many times we are disciplined on our job because of our actions. But what God does is discipline us before we act. In other words, he begins to put these guardrails in our lives so that ultimately we can know without a shadow of a doubt we're heading in the right direction right? Rather than um, we head in the wrong direction and then God disciplines us. Ultimately, what that is the result of is be not deceived, God is not mocked. What you sow is what you're going to reap. In other words, you plant, you plant bad seeds, guess what's eventually going to happen, right? You, you plant apple seeds, you get a what? An apple tree. You get the consequences of what you sow and what you reap. And also, remember, the consequences of of life in general is because of the fall of man. Adam and Eve sinned against God, and because of that, we die, we get sick, you know, people kill each other, we get mad at each other, and all these different things, and we do evil things because of the fall of man, not necessarily because we ourselves did something wrong, right? Remember, even the scriptures talks about once we were born, guess what happens to our our earthly bodies? It decays. Not because we did something wrong, but because of the sin nature of man. Sin entered the world, therefore all die. Because of Adam sinned, all die. Because Jesus died, all live. Makes sense. 
All right, so God is not one who is reactionary, right? So God's discipline is already out in front of us to prevent, to cause us to be prevented from sinning against him rather than, okay, you got caught by God and now I'm going to spank you. God already knows what we're going to do. That's why he gets before it and allows circumstances, situations, relationships to happen to ultimately develop our hearts and discipline our hearts so that we won't succumb to what he already knows is coming down the line. Make sense? So that being said, when God's discipline occurs, you find in verse 11, it's ultimately to train us. It's to train us. The word train here in verse 11 means this, to exercise vigorously in any way. Exercise vigorously in any way. We have been blessed with a lot of uh, gym rats, we call it, in our church, or fit people who are physically fit and train others and things like that. But listen, the Bible goes on to talk about more in detail what this word train means. It's either the body or the mind. It's the body or the mind. We even have people who are psychologists, psychiatrists, and counselors and so forth that you could say trains the mind, trains the behavior. But at the end of the day, God's, if you would, training goes beyond all of this, goes beyond just the physical and the mind. He trains us from the inside out. And that's why the last definition of this word train is super important. It means this, to exercise naked. (laughs) Or I like to say exposed. In other words, when God trains us. Listen, he trains us and he, he leaves us open and bare. There, there is nothing that is untouched by God when God is training us, right? How many, how many of you understand what I'm talking about? When God trains you, he exposes every flaw on the inside of you that you never thought you, you ever had. But some way, somehow, how he finds that flaw and ultimately reaches down in the crevices of our soul to make sure that we are adequately equipped and trained like this. Now, here's the challenge. One way or the other, we're going to be trained. We're going to be trained either in a good way or we're going to be trained in a bad way. And let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 14. And our key verse really is verse 14, but again, reading it in context, we're going to back up to verse 4. And our hearts, listen, at the end of the day, it's going to be trained one direction or another, one direction or another. And it says in in verse 4 through 14, it says this, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the, uh, the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds." Listen to what verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly, do you hear that, from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Two wonderful promises there, just as a side note, that God can rescue you from your temptation and he will deal with those who are unjust. He will deal with them. So let him deal with them. And we're going to get into that later. Influencing your world. Have you ever wondered why you were born where you were born? Why this family? Why this particular community? Why this part of the world? Why do I have these friends? Why this school at this time? Why this church? It's simple. God, through his sovereign wisdom, he knows precisely what you need to fulfill his purposes in you for his glory. You can purchase this book and others by Cedric Brown at cedricbrown.com. Verse 10 says, and especially those in, indulge in the flesh, in its, its corrupt desires and despise authority, daring, self-will. They do not tremble when they revile angelic um, uh, majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power 
do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reveling where they have no knowledge, while in the destruction of their creatures also be destroyed. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are, stain, they are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, and they carouse with you. Now listen to verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Do you hear that? One's heart's going to be trained one way or the other. It's going to be trained after your own passions, your own lust, or it's going to be trained where? In righteousness. Makes sense so far. And that's why if you then look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, again, heart's going to be trained one way or the other, one direction or the other. Listen to how well-disciplined hearts should be trained. Verse 6 says, In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables. And ladies, brace yourself because I didn't write this. Fit only for old women. <laughs> on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily dif- discipline is only of little profit. Now, again, it says little profit, so it doesn't mean that bodily discipline isn't good, right? But it's only for a little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So remember, here's the wonderful promise that we have with the Lord. You can be an exercise guru and you can be in the most fit shape that your life is, you've ever experienced your life. You could take care of everything on the outside, but bypass everything on the inside. Your soul will not be disciplined at all. But this is one thing that's for sure with the Lord. You discipline your soul, you will always take care of this temple that he's given you. Listen, the, the Spirit of God will not allow you to continue to destroy what really belongs to him. You follow me? In other words, you could continue to pursue diets and exercise regimens, but at the end of the day, you always have he- uh, highs and lows, ebbs and flows, or, or you will never be able to reach that pinnacle in which you lustfully, lustfully desire to be. In other words, someone's arms will be better than yours. Someone's legs and calves will be better than yours, right? Someone's abs will be more than yours, right? Right? You always have this comparison to the flesh and those that are around you and pictures that you see. But the wonderful promise that God gives you and I is that when we discipline the soul, He will make sure, he will bring conviction in your heart to say, why do you keep keep eating that cake, Cedric? (laughs) Come on now, you know it's Thanksgiving and you know you don't need that anymore. You know, how many Thanksgivings are you going to come and you're going to eat the whole cake? You ever been there? Right, I mean, but, but something on the inside, someone on the inside that disciplines our soul says, no, that's enough, that's enough. Care for what belongs to me. This is why you should exercise. Not to become like that person, but to care for what I've given you. Different approach. Different approach. Don't do this to please your husband. You know why? Because once he makes you mad, then you start eating for comfort. Don't do this to get this man because because once you get him, you're going to realize he really isn't what satisfies you and then you stop doing it. Do it because you belong to me. And you're supposed to care for 
what belongs to me. The word discipline here in verse 11, again, Hebrews chapter 12, it means this. I'm sorry, discipline in 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 8, means this. Whatever cultivates the soul. That's what God is about, is cultivating our soul. It also means this, by correcting mistakes and curbing passions. See the difference? Cultivates the soul, starts correcting your mistakes and curbing your passions. It also means the instruction which aims at increasing your virtue. In other words, who you really are on the inside. Live trained. Men and women who stand in awe of God live well-trained lives because they know who they belong to. How do we live in awe of God? Again, we're back in Hebrews chapter 12, now verses 12 through 13. It says this, Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Listen, church. Living a life in awe of God is living a healed life. Not a life that keeps going back to the past pains. Not a life that continues to dig up dirt not a life that continues to walk limped. You follow me? Not saying physically, because remember we talked about the outer man decays day by day. We're going to get, trust me, the older we get, the more cricks and cranks and, you know, more lubricants you're going to need. At the end of the day, this body's going to die, period. Trust me. It's going to die. It's going to decay. But the inward man is being what? Renewed day by day. The real us is being renewed day by day. And listen, church, in our deep parts of our hearts, our soul must be healed once and for all. Once and for all. We can't be, continue to live like that child who was abused anymore. We cannot continue to live like that, that woman or that man who was abused or misused or wasn't appreciated in relationship one or two or three or four. We got to live healed. We cannot live like little boys and girls whose mamas and daddies didn't show up at your game or your recital or didn't buy you this or give you this. We got to keep, we got to become men and women who can't live like that anymore, but live healed. Live healed. That's what men and women of God who live in awe of God do. We start living healed. You see, the word strengthen means this. To make up right again, to restore, to build a new. If any man is in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things that passed away, and behold, all things have become new. How does the old continue to find its way into your new life? Is when I do not live in Christ. The word weak means this, to neglect or to leave unattended. You see what God does? Remember we talked about being trained and trained naked? What God does when we're training naked, he ultimately wants to heal us. I've never seen anyone have surgery fully dressed. You know, age 50, I had a colonoscopy. And they took everything from me. <laughs> It, it, it was a scary journey, but I did it. I survived. Right? I mean, you're vulnerable. You are laid bare in the hands of strangers. So you can be healed. What better hands are we are in? To be healed. To heal those weak areas. Strengthen the hands that are weak. 
So I believe that's personal application, but then we're going to read when it comes to the weak, if you would, hands in the body. But I believe there's weak areas, personal applications, that God wants to strengthen once and for all. If not, we're going to continue to be laid bare, laid bare, laid bare, open, laid open, until we simply say, okay, God, heal me. Let me live healed in this. The word healed means this, to cure, to make whole, to free from errors and sin. How many times are we going to err and 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 err in the same area until we heal? You don't fix the marriage number one. Trust me, it's going to show up marriage number two. Three, four. If you don't heal it in a relationship in the body of Christ in church one, it's going to happen in church two, church three, church four. Friendship one, friendship two, friendship three, job one, job two is going to be over and over again. The cycle is going to repeat over and over again until you come to a place that, you know what? I'm free from error. I'm free. Not the environment, but I am free from error. Hello, my name is Sarah Vega, and I am the Administrative and Executive Director here at Commitment Church. I hope you've enjoyed today's message by Pastor Cedric Brown. If you didn't know, Pastor Cedric also sends out encouraging videos weekly. We call these the Weekly Wire. We can send these encouraging videos directly to you by subscribing at www dot love all nations dot org here's an example of the encouragement you'll receive a problem with losing control or losing your composure or maybe the other side of the coin is that you have a problem with being in control of people and situations that are important to you well there's a bible verse that says this like a city without walls and broken into it's like a man who has no control over his spirit. In other words, I think this verse is saying to you and I, whenever we want to be in control, whenever we are out of control, it's because we have not given up all control to the one who deserves it completely. And that is, we must become men and women who realize whenever we are at that brink of being in control or out of control, that we give up control to God. In other words, he is the only one that can protect us when we feel vulnerable and out of control. He is the only one that can manage the hearts of people that we want to control and even manage the situations that we want to be in control of. So again, the next time that you or I want to be in control of people and situations or we are out of control, because we have not given all control and complete control to the one who deserves all control. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope you enjoyed the sample of our Weekly Wire. Again, to subscribe to your weekly inspiration, refreshment, and encouragement, please visit www.loveallnations.org. Thank you again for listening to our series, In Awe, From Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Hebrews 12.28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Throughout this series, we hope you are reminded how awesome our God is whom we serve and worship, and that you are encouraged to have a life of worship for our Lord. If you want to listen to the previous messages in this series, or if you want to hear messages from other series, visit Commitment Church on YouTube or Pastor Cedric Brown on Spotify, Pandora, or other podcast providers. You can also visit us on our website, commitmentchurch.org. And if you live in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey area, we would love to see you in person as well. You can attend any of our services by visiting us at 2 Berlin Road South, Lindenwald, New Jersey, 08021. Thank you again for listening, and have a blessed and wonderful day.